Tonight's featured speaker, Laura O. Foster, has lived in Portland since 1989. Before becoming Portland's expert on offbeat routes, hidden pathways, and quirky tidbit, tidbits about the area, Laura worked as a technical writer and then as a nonfiction book editor. The popular Portland Hill Walks was published in 2005. She's recently published a revised version that includes five new longer walks. In the walking routes, she describes, she weaves in geology, geographic features, heritage trees and native plants, streetcar development, and the evolution of urban spaces over time. Her other books have become equally popular, Portland City Walks, Walk There, The Portland Stairs Book, and Images of America, Lake Oswego. Laura has written for pa Powell's online blog, for Portland Monthly Magazine, and frequently for Metro. Please welcome Laura Foster. Well, thank you for inviting me. I feel really honored to be in such good company as people like Matt Love and uh, the others that you are having. Uh, I, I sat with Matt at an um, author fair a year or so ago, and it was sort of an unforgettable experience, so I think you'll enjoy him <laughs> quite a bit. So one thing that is intrigue, intrigues me about walking just about anywhere is the stories that are in plain sight. Um, I'm a person that always asks questions. I'm not afraid to ask a dumb question because often there's um, an intriguing answer. And so I call myself a forensic pedestrian because, partly because I've been influenced by my husband who is a geologist and he's a native Portlander. When I started thinking of writing a book of walking tours of city neighborhoods, partly because there has been no nothing like that in existence, there were books that talked that wrote about Forest Park, and uh, books that explored the gorge, of course, and, and Mount Hood, but nothing really uh, explored Portland and nearby cities like Milwaukee or Lake Oswego in, in an urban way. And um, so I found that niche. But as a forensic pedestrian, uh, I like to dig into, uh, f at its most basic element is how humans have shaped the landscape, you know, how we've cut and filled and how we've um, just altered the land in ways that are intriguing once you see them and have them interpreted for you. So here we go. This uh, is one of my favorite places in town, Rocky Butte, and a lot of people who've lived here for many decades say that when they were kids, it was a place to avoid because it had gotten very trashy. People, I even had one guy tell me at a talk that they used to um, take jalopies and roll them off the cliffs there. So it was a place to hang out and party, and, um, but in the 90s, it got listed on the National Register of Historic Places by an architectural historian in Portland. And it's historic. It's a, a WPA work, the second biggest WPA project in Oregon after Timberline Lodge. And it's got the same sort of stonework that you see all over Oregon, um, and which started with the Columbia River Highway. And then those craftsmen taught unskilled laborers to, to do this kind of hand-carved stonework. Uh, and that's and Rocky Butte. Look at this beautiful basket arches. And to me, what's, what's sort of ironic and beautiful and sad about the place is that um, well, what's beautiful about it is I think it's the most scenic overlook in Portland. You can see all the way to, to Crown Point and then to the St. John's Bridge and the north way far. It, the back, the south end is a little bit obscured by the other side of Rocky Butte. But these, so these men were given this, you know, make work projects like so many WPA projects were and they were taught how to carve stone. And instead of being able to continue on with that craft and, and produce more and more wonderful things for the city, well, World War II interrupted and most of them went to work in the shipyard. So a lot of that handcraft ended abruptly with the war. Uh, so to me, these kind of places where it's really evident and, and loved and cared for are, are just treasures. And this, when I first went up to Rocky Butte, you can see how beautifully landscaped it is now by this group called um, the Rocky Butte Preservation Society. I saw that and I thought, well, why don't they take that down? That's quite unattractive. Uh, but it's historic. It's an airway beacon from the era before we had radio communication. And uh, the early pilots would fly just looking at geographic landmarks from um, landmark to landmark or follow a river or peak to peak. But they couldn't do that at night, of course. And so this, uh, the national government needed mail delivered 24 hours a day. And so they instituted the system of um, nighttime airway beacons about 40 miles apart. And you would fly from beacon to beacon in clear weather. And this one it still remains. Um, and there's another one in the gorge somebody told me recently. And it still has a light in it, but it's not used for anything other than just kind of um, 
preserving the historic aspect of it. But my husband, who grew up in the West Hills, said they could see this from their house when he was a kid in the 60s, and they all thought that it was a searchlight that would, would be activated to look for um, escapees from the Rocky Butte Jail. <laughs> so, so I was happy to tell him he was wrong about that. So here's the geologic um, story that fascinates me. And one thing I love about Portland and the area is that there's so many different geologic forces that shaped our landscape. Everything from, you know, ge um, the, the flood basalts that seeped over two-thirds of Oregon millions and millions of years ago, hundreds of feet deep, to the most recent events were the Missoula floods. And the Missoula floods, as you probably know, came down and carved the Columbia River Gorge out of western Montana. And when they hit Portland, they started filling up the Willamette Valley like a bathtub all the way south to Eugene. And when they hit Rocky Butte, which is the first big monolith as they come out of the gorge, they started swirling around. And just as at the beach when the waves hit a rock, it, it does strange things to the sand. And it left this long trail of um, rock, which is Alameda Ridge. And all of North Portland has um, these river cobbles in the soil. And this is going down Wad Bluff. Um, and, does anybody know where Wad Bluff is? Oh, you have to go see it. It has a brand new trail. This is the trail um, as it was oh, 2006 or so when I took this photo. So if you're at University of Portland on Willamette Boulevard and you're on top of the Willamette Bluff, you can go down to Swan Island on this trail and it's just it's now been improved. It's a multi-use trail and there's a, um, cro a dangerous crossing of railroad tracks that is now lo no longer dangerous because they um, built a bridge across it and you can um, ride your bike or roll your bike down it. Anyway, and then that gets you down onto Swan Island, which is a whole another story of fascinating uh, geology, geography, and history. Uh, and the Willamette Bluff is, is historic in that it's sort of an accidental green space. It's one of the few places in the region, um, pretty much from the Selwood area all the way out to St. John's, where we have this um, oak uh, woodland habitat still preserved, didn't get destroyed. and. Um, so this is Willamette Falls. Uh, I, I love river towns like Milwaukee and Oregon City. Um, I grew up in the Midwest in, on a river town, and then I went to school in Dubuque, Iowa for a while. And river towns just have so much personality because of the history and the great old architecture. Uh, Willamette Falls is, I think it's the 16th largest waterfall by volume in the world. It's just quite enormous, and I think it's way underappreciated by most of us, probably because of what it's surrounded by, all the industry. <laughs> it, uh, but in a way, it's sort of like a scene out of Dickens, if you go look at it on a cloudy, gloomy day. It's really atmospheric. Uh, that concrete lip around the top of it is about 14 feet high, and that was, I'm, I don't know exactly when that was put in, but it was to raise the river level for power generation. And this, um, I'll use this little thing here. This is a very, very old fish ladder. I don't know how old, but um, it's, a, you know, of course, a historic site to Native Americans, and they still go there to harvest lamprey. Um, they're the only ones allowed to do that. So we have a series of photographs of stairways. I'm fascinated by them. I think ever since I lived in Dubuque, which is a very steep little town on the bank, on the bluffs of the Mississippi. And Portland's the same way. We have lots of staircases, and there's uh, a few wooden ones left. Back um, pre-1900, everywhere, um, Milwaukee, Oregon, or excuse me, Milwaukee and Portland, everywhere, people, the, the sidewalks were wood. They weren't concrete. And there were actually just mills, and that's all they milled were sidewalk, sidewalk lumber. And this is one of the remnants of, from that era. And the, the brick thing is a, um, a remnant from... Uh, a reservoir system that predated the Bull Run water system, probably from the 1880s or so. And this is just south of PSU. So if you're walking down um, Park Avenue, Park Place, or you know the, the park blocks, keep going, cross over 205, and then veer slightly to the right so you can get to the, the little stub of 10th Avenue. Alameda Ridge, like I mentioned, it's a, it's a big pile of igneous rock, not igneous, but um, is it igneous? Oh, I shouldn't venture into that because I'm not sure about all my different rock sources. But anyway, it's one of those places that has radon issues because the, the source of the rock is, um, there's a lot of granite in there. And uh, granite, unlike basalt, has radon in it. And there's 11 staircases on it. So in one of my books, uh, in Portland Hill Walks, I, I go up some of the stairs. I take you on some of them. And at the top, the homes are enormous with big views. And at the bottom, they're charming and bungalow and treed and cozy. And it's just a really great juxtaposition of different types of neighborhoods on the ridge. 
This is the longest staircase in Portland, but it's not all one, so that's a bit of a stretch. Uh, there's landings there, and this is on Mount Tabor. It starts at Southeast 69th and Yamhill, and then goes to the summit. And I was, I, I took a group of 45 people on this walk the other day, and we, it was a Sunday, and the, the stairs were just thick with people running them up and down repeatedly, not just for exercise. And it's quite a marvel. Um, more wooden steps, and there's a, an, a city ordinance I found in 1904 that started that um, said no wooden sidewalks shall be built or constructed hereafter upon any street. It is the duty of the property owners to construct sidewalks of artificial stone, vitrified or repressed paving brick or asphalt. So I guess the artificial stone went out. And there's one on um, the, the, the Thurman Street Bridge is another um, wooden sidewalk. There's there's not many left. This is one of the staircases on Alameda Ridge, and there's one of those cute bungalows. Um, so this is the Rose City Park neighborhood down below in that home. And like so many Portland neighborhoods, and I don't know that much about Milwaukee's neighborhoods, but in Portland, you know, the city was um, developed with an immense streetcar network. And so people in neighborhoods like Rose City Park here, they didn't have to own a vehicle. And indeed, a lot of those houses were built in 1904, 1905, when nobody even was thinking of buying vehicles. And so to get into um, town, they would just walk two blocks from this point anyway and get to the streetcar that like, went up Sandy Boulevard. And so um, one of the things I like to do, I'll show you later, is uh, the garages, how people retrofitted their homes for garages kind of forensically. It's just fun to... Um, see the inventive and sometimes horrific in, uh, solutions they came up with to stick a garage onto a 50 by 100 lot that wasn't intended for one. This is a neat staircase. I love this one. It, you can start in Northwest 23rd and end there, do a loop, and go up these many, many stairs, this one and a couple others, and then head on up to Piddock Mansion via the, the street that the Piddocks would have driven on. Um, uh, I think it's Mc, not McClay. I can't remember what it is. Monte Vista, Ter Monte Vista Terrace. Yeah, it's now pedestrian only, but anyway, wonderful walk through a beautiful neighborhood, and this particular staircase has an unusual gutter-like feature in the balustrade that is totally non-functional because it's filled up with debris, but it's pretty. This is the one, a staircase right above that one, and I ran, I was leading a tour a couple years ago on a Saturday, and the whole staircase was getting decked out for a wedding that was about to take place there because the bride and groom had met on the stairs, on those stairs. Yeah. Another staircase, 157 steps. Um, firefighters do run these, that, this one and the other two that we just saw. And I, so I, I had heard that. I thought, well, is that an urban legend? So I called the firefighters at the station in northwest Portland, and they said, yes, we do run them up, but we never run down. So, <laughs> so they, they go down the streets. And I, and I had also heard that they ran them in their full turnout gear, and they said, no, we just wear sweatpants. <laughs> so I was like, lady. Here's another WPA um, beautiful, beautiful thing. This is one of the Cornell Road tunnels if, right near the Audubon Society of Portland. And it's not a really pleasant walk, but if you're walking, say, from, um, oh, Chapman Elementary School where the Vox of Swifts come to roost, you can walk up Cornell, and if you're brave enough, there's not really great shoulder, but all along there, there's this WPA, these, um, uh, I forget, what, bollards that are, some of them are overgrown with ivy, and there's little rock walls that are, just complement this kind of work, and I think it should be preserved and enhanced, because it's sort of being consumed by nature, and um, like I said, there's just, a, this is sort of an irrepeatable uh, bit of our history. So I came across this park one day and thought I, I had found a little mini country club, but this is a city park, um, the Hillside Community Center, but it, is, it, it does have private roots. It's in the Hillside neighborhood, which is the neighborhood right below the Piddock Mansion, filled with gorgeous homes. And this is where Miss Catlin's School for Girls was until it merged with the Gable Country Day School and became Catlin Gable out in Southwest Barnes Road in Portland. So Miss Catlin's School for Girls, as you can imagine from the title, was a private school um, for well-off Portland girls and young women. And, um, but unfortunately, it was in this ravine between two ridges and... Um, had a lot of uh, geotechnical issues, and the buildings were sway-backed and cockeyed, and so everything got torn down when they moved. There's nothing left there except this um, gymnasium built in, I think it was 47, by, and designed by Pietro Belusky. 
so it's, it's worth seeing. It's got a beautiful, clear, vertical grain um, fur ceiling. It's just lovely. Another staircase, Willamette Heights. That's one of those neighborhoods that um, a lot of Portlanders who've lived in Portland all their life have never ventured into because it's kind of a, a dead end, surrounded by Forest Park and by um, Balch Creek on one side. It's got a canyon on one side, and so you have to cross over the canyon to get into it. It's really special. So this is um, my favorite walk I've ever written is the one in Portland Hill Walks that takes you um, from 24th and Burnside in Portland up through the very old, oldest parts of Washington Park, up through the Rose Gardens and into the neighborhoods above. And my husband grew up in that area. And so when we were dating, he took me on this walk to show me this little thing. This was the highlight of the evening for, for him, anyway. <laughs> and so if I, you know where the reservoirs are in Washington Park. When they were being excavated by hand labor back in 1890, 92, 1993, um, they didn't know that that was the body of an ancient landslide. And when they had removed enough land from the reservoir to hold the reservoirs, um, the whole hillside started to slump. And uh, this is the very top edge of it. Over on the left, there's a tennis court that's on the kind of the solid ground, and the right tennis court. Um, is in the body of the slide, so it's constantly moving, even still. So in the 1890s, when they realized that they, they had a landslide issue, they, they put in drainage pipe to drain the hillside, get water off the hillside quickly, which is what you do if you've got landslide issues. And then they had to rip out all the concrete in the reservoirs and rebuild them. And so even today in Washington Park, you can see old concrete uh, retaining walls made out of you know broken up concrete block, and, and that was that's the source of them. Um, oh, and then the other part of that story is that the, the Rose Garden uh, had, you know how it's terraced so formally. It was terraced like that because it was meant to be a, a residential neighborhood, kind of like the neighborhoods right above it. And so the developer sued the city after the, the land slid because his land was no longer, you know, nobody wanted, would buy lots that were prone to sliding. And the city eventually won the land. And then when World War I began, um, that's when it, it began its life as a rose test garden. <laughs> Old streetcar tracks, yeah, they're, they're not uncommon, but these ones are gone. This is on Northwest 23rd, and they'd pave them over every year, and then um, every winter they would wrestle their way right up out of the pavement. And so I took a picture of them before they totally ripped them out a few years ago. Uh, this is a milestone, and, it, you know, it's a metaphor. A milestone is a, me you know, a marker in our life, but there really were such things as milestones, and this is one of them. This is um, P2, it stands for... Uh, if you're at that point, you're two miles from Portland. This is on Stark Street, which is a very historic street. It's part of the system of um, land surveys that allowed the U.S. government to give away land to homesteaders so that uh, Americans would occupy the land and hopefully be in place in case there were any threats to our ownership of this country. Like, there, you know, there was um, even until the 18, I think, 50s or so, um, 18... Uh, when we worked, when we um, worked out the com compromise with Great Britain over um, the, cr the boundary of the U.S. Anyway, so on Stark Street today, you can find these. There's one on Mount Tabor at 61st and Stark, and um, for going further east. And then the Willamette Stone State Park is where um, the, Mer the Willamette Meridian and the baseline intersect. And from that point of beginning, all real property is measured. So if you have a, a real estate and you look at the deed, it'll, it'll reference that point and your property's um, location relative to it. So in one of my walks in, in the new book, um, I have you go pretty much from downtown all the way up to Willamette Stone State Park via trails and, and beautiful staircases. And um, it's kind of nice. This is another interesting thing. Of course, we've seen these all our lives. So um, when I was writing my book, I thought, all right, well, what is that called? It's got to have a name, and what's the story? And the story was these were, they're, they were glass, clear glass originally, turned purple because of the manganese in them. Exposure to ultraviolet light turns the, the glass purple. And so in city sidewalks all over the country, there would be basements under the sidewalks. And even after the advent of electricity, often those basements were just lit by a single bulb hanging from a cord in the middle of the basement. And um, way back in the recesses where you'd want to store stuff, it was hard to see things. So they put these in to bring light into the basement. And they, what they have in common in whaling ships is they serve the same purpose on decks and ships um, to allow light below. And then this is what they look like when they get too um, chewed up by just use over, over time. 
This is, of course, um, for garbage. And you know, if you've ever had one of those or lifted one out, it's about this big and about this round, and that was supposed to hold your family's garbage for a week. And I think we should sort of be ashamed of ourselves. <laughs> that would totally be out of the question. I mean, that's like a bathtub or bathroom-sized garbage can at this point. Uh, and so, also, they're probably not really ergonomic for the poor garbage men to have to lift heavy garbage out from low. So they're no longer functional, but I think they're charming. And um, I always open them up if, I, if I'm not trespassing too much. And I found one um, on Front Avenue right near Arthur. There's an underground pedestrian walkway at Arthur in front that's really creepy because it's used by homeless folks. I mean, just be, it's creepy in that as a woman alone, I, I hesitate to walk through there sometimes. Um, but anyway, so I opened it up, and inside somebody had stored their um, sleeping bag. Oh, that's yeah. Perfect, yeah. And then, and it was nice and dry. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that nice? This is on um, Northwest Thurman, uh, at about 26th or so. And uh, what I like is that they left it there to just let time kind of have its way with that fire hydrant. And then about 10 feet away, there's a new one. <laughs> So we, you know, the horse, does Milwaukee have horse rings on its sidewalks? Okay, good. Well, when I first moved here, um, I'm from the Midwest, and for, I know we had streetcars too, but I think there was no relics of the streetcar life back when I was growing up in my hometown of Aurora, Illinois. And so I saw the, I had one on my, um, in front of my house in Hollywood when I first moved here, and I just assumed that everybody had um, a horse. But na that's not the case. If you lived in the city, you just got, you used the streetcar to get around. Um, and these sidewalks, like I said earlier, they, they didn't start to get poured until 1903 or in four in Portland anyway. And so the, the rings date from that time. And uh, soon after, you know, vehicles started to appear. But it wasn't, uh, it was mostly d delivery trucks, like for your, um, your heating, the wood that you would use to heat your home or ice that you'd have delivered or your groceries. The guy would tie up his truck to, or his horse to the ring and, um, so, and then a few years ago, some artists did that. And now you see dinosaurs and other things tied up to the rings. So I see you have a poetry post here at the Letting, at the Pond House. And this is a, I don't think it's happening all over the country, but the Northwest seems to be a, a hot spot for poetry posts. And this is Mike Ryerson, who himself is a, is a bit of a, an interesting bit of history. He's the person that took the photograph of Portland's Mayor Bud Clark exposing himself to art. Oh, yeah. he, he worked with Bud, I think, as his campaign manager at the time. And he then wrote for the Northwest Examiner, a neighborhood newsletter, for years. So he was pondering uh, the poetry posts. And just as a side, um, there's a young guy uh, that I met via Facebook. So Facebook has got some great, I meet mean, nice people in Facebook. Um, he, if you have a smartphone, you can do PDX trees or public art PDX, download these free apps, and then as you're, as you're strolling around, and I think it's, it's beyond Portland too, I'm not sure if he's got Milwaukee, you can, um, you can learn about the trees, like who planted it, what, how old it is, et cetera, and same thing is happening with the poetry posts. So if you want to craft a walk of um, poetry posts where you can stop and read them, like I did here with a group, um, we, we went around 15 or 20, different poetry posts, took turns reading them, and it was a surprisingly charming walk because it's fun to have something to pivot your walk on, you know, whether it's, sometimes I look at garages, and sometimes, you know, heritage trees, do a hunt for them, and then, of course, you see lots of other things along the way. Um, this is just like... So one of the things I love about the the Northwest, is that people are so at ease with nature, they don't corral it into tidy little islands. And the Willamette Heights neighborhood is one of those places where just about every street will end in a pathway into Forest Park. And this is a, a really remote street called Northwest Alexandra Avenue. It goes over a, um, a creek canyon, so you're up at tree level. And then just beyond it is the White Shield home. It's a home for um, girls who are in bad situations, you know, abuse or pregnancy or things like that. And it was started in, I forget what decade, by Henry Wemmy. He was an entrepreneur who had made a lot of money outfitting um, uh, men who were heading out to Alaska for the um, Klondike Gold Rush. So anyway, Henry Wemmy 
used some of his money philanthropically, and he opened up what was called the Henry Wem Wemmy Home for Unwed Mothers. And that building is still there, hidden behind the trees. And I didn't want to take a picture of it because it, it, they try to keep a pretty low profile. So you walk past it, and then off to the left, there's one of those kind of backdoor entrances into Forest Park that's just totally charming, and you can avoid the crowds, and right away you're, you're in a different world. So when I write, I don't always focus on beautiful things. Um, you know, cities have their stories of um, debacles and poor judgment and things like that. And one of the mistakes Portland almost made was to cover most of itself with freeways that would allow um, easy um, egress into the downtown. And this is a good example. Of, this is Front Avenue or NATO Parkway. Used to be a two-lane street, kind of like you know any commercial street where there were businesses on both sides, residences too, uh, and then they they ripped out mo all of that, made it a four-lane thoroughfare, and, uh, and then they thought, well, what are we going to do about those school kids on that uh, who are on on that side, and then their homes over here? So they built this ugly pedestrian bridge in the 40s, and um, now that school, the failing school in Portland, is is the nat national home of natural medicine. Uh, and it's just on this little island surrounded by Ross Island Bridge ramps and I-5. It's just a horrible little spot. But it's fun if you finally do get there. Uh, it just sort of, you just feel like you've accomplished something that day. Here's another one of those pedestrian bridges over I-5. And in my new book, I was really happy to find a photograph of um, I-5 through North Portland. It used to be called the Minnesota Freeway because that's the, the street that it displaced, North Minnesota Avenue. And I found a picture that in there, um, in the city archives, of Minnesota Avenue after they took down all the homes. And there were these 1920s kind of English Tudor type homes. Took them all down, and all that's left are the, the, um, a row of front porch steps. And, and just like, it's just so sad. You know, little sidewalks, little bit of uh, steps, and then vacant lots. Uh, but it's not that I'm against progress, but you know, sometimes you, you just. Um, Sometimes I am against progress, I guess I am. <laughs> I saw a map recently of Portland before freeways, and it just was so contiguous. I mean, you could just walk anywhere without having you know, a wall of awful noise um, confront you. OK, here's my garage thing. <laughs> this one, I think, is pretty well done. They could get a door that was a little bit more period appropriate. But it's pretty nice. Um, they just probably back when they had a Model A or T, something small, they cut away the front yard and retained it with, and op used the basement space for the garage. Um, here's one, this is on in Willamette Heights. And some of these actually have tunnels going up to the home above. And then this is one I would say is less successful. <laughs> this is also in Northwest Portland. Another thing I look for are tree, historic trees. I mean, and it's, it's sort of easy to find a heritage tree because it has a sign on it. And there's a wonderful book, um, Heritage Trees of Portland, that um, I forget her name. Anyway, she just revised it, and I recommend that book because she created five tree walks. You can get that book at the Audubon Society. And do you, do you have it in the library? Heritage Trees of Portland? Yeah. Phyllis Reynolds is the author, yeah. Anyway, but there are some trees that don't tell you their story. You have to sort of know the background. And so Mount Tabor was one of those places that was, um, it was orchard country, a lot like Milwaukee was. Um, it was very early. 1849 was the California gold rush. And soon after that, it was apparent that there was sort of an insatiable appetite and lots of money to be, uh, appetite for fresh fruit and produce. And so uh, people quickly planted Mount Tabor in orchards. And then it wasn't until 1889 when the, the first streetcar went across the Willamette that it started getting platted out for neighborhoods. So these three trees are planted at about orchard distance apart. They're apples, and they're, they're so ancient, they're, you know, they're quite um, hollow inside. And I'm pretty sure that they are orchard remnants from, from those days. Here's another tree with a story. This is one of the flowering cherry trees that lined the runways and um, the perimeter of Swan Island when it was Portland's first airport. Um, it was dedicated, Swan Island was said to have been the most beautiful airport in the nation. Um, it had this art deco terminal and the, the cherry trees that um, probably a lot, they're the same kind of cherry trees that we have in um, Waterfront Park right now. But um, 
Charles Lindbergh came to Portland in 1927 to dedicate it, and even at the time he was sort of going, mm, I don't know about this, because right at one end of Swine Island there's the Willamette Bluff, a, you know, 150-foot high bluff, and so while you're taxiing down the runway, you have to quickly ascend <laughs> to not hit that. And as planes got bigger and they needed longer runways, it was pretty clear, even by the early years of the Depression, that we needed a new airport. And that's when they started uh, filling um, what is today the Portland International Airport. It was a, a WPA project to fill that. So, and then when World War II happened, Swan Island turned into one of the shipbuilding centers, and most of these trees got raised. So this one is left, and Swan Island's just a great place to take a walk because of the, the ships that are right there in the, in the lagoon. Um, you can see the Port of Portland Terminal 2, the crane over there. And the views of downtown are, are none you can have anywhere else. This is kind of the angle is, is pretty, pretty beautiful. This is on a Swan Island beach. You can walk along the beach there at low water. Um, there's great driftwood, and you can see, I mean, the um, ocean-going vehicles or uh, ships. And then I just discovered this thanks to another Facebook friend. There's a website called marinetraffic.com. So if you are into ships or just curious, you can um, take a photo of it or jot it down and then go to marinetraffic.com. It'll tell you where it came from, what the cargo is, how old it is, and then you can actually track it on the map as it moves down the channel. It's really cool. And if they're in dry dock, it'll tell you that. Um, wonderful. And you can actually, they, they have an app you can download for $5, but if you don't want to do that, you can just go on um, to their main website. Another not beautiful thing, but um, quite interesting. This is St. John's, so I'm, I was standing just near the St. John's Bridge in St. John's. There's the railroad bridge to the left, uh, and those pilings uh, are, some of them in part, are the old St. John's Ferry, which was the last ferry um, in downtown Portland, or in Portland, um, replaced by the St. John's Bridge. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then let's this area here, th well, this whole thing from um, the Fremont Bridge to the, uh, beyond the St. John's is a super fun site, toxic sediments, in the, especially in the, in the river bottom. Uh, and one of the big uh, offenders is this site here. This is the site of Gasco. It's where um, oil was gasified. And um, in that process, I think it was starting in the early 1900s, the first oil gasification plant was down um, in northwest Portland, right about where the um, Cooch, Cooch and um, First, or Cooch and Front. But anyway, so they moved out here. They started dumping all their refuse and sediments, and so it, it, it's, a, it's a problem that's not addressed. But you can see this, all this landfill here. This used to be a lake, much like Giles Lake used to be a lake, but it's now an industrial area. And then here's Forest Park above. Uh, so it's really kind of a beautiful scene, and you can actually walk from here under the railroad bridge um, at low water in the summer, and you shouldn't do it alone, maybe because, or maybe bring a pit bull or something, because there's a lot of people, you know, who are living there, and they're not really welcoming of pedestrians, but it's still interesting. St. John's Bridge, and one of my favorite neighborhoods, this is Linton. I mean, Linton is uh, interesting in itself, but this particular neighborhood of Linton is one that's totally enveloped by For Forest Park, uh, and most people have never heard of it. It's called Whitwood Court. And the old St. John's Ferry went from here to about here, and I have an old AAA map that's only about 10 years old, and it still calls that road over there Ferry Avenue, and now it's got a new name called um, Napton General Road. So, um, and the ferry would take people over here, and then way back in um, Hudson Bay Company time when people were trapping the Tualatin River Valley. They would take this ancient road, Springville Road today, up over the mountains and down the other side into the valley, and that's where they would um, bring their pelts up that road and take it to Fort Vancouver and trade with um, John McLaughlin. And they, those pelts would end up um, in England on men's hats. Historic road. Uh, this is a staircase that I think I've solved the mystery of, but I won't go into it here. So above the St. John's Bridge, you're in Forest Park, and have, have you been on Leif Erikson Drive hiking? Yeah, it's this beautiful, I think either 11 or 13 mile long roadway that was put, carved in the woods, uh, not, not quite halfway up the slopes of the West Hills. And uh, in 1910 or so, when they, when they built the road, they envisioned it would be um, the main conduit to a series of subdivisions that would go from Northwest Portland all the way out to the St. John's area on the west side. 
But the land soon started sliding, and um, a few people, like this person, built a home there, and this is all that's left of that home. But most of the properties were abandoned to the city, non-payment of taxes, and that they are a big chunk of why we have Forest Park today. The city had just didn't have to buy the land, it was just um, defaulted on. And another neat thing about this is, has anybody read the book My Abandonment by Peter Rock? Yeah, that's a great book about this uh, father. You, I'm sure you know the story, the father and the daughter that lived in Forest Park for five or six years, and then Peter Rock fictionalized it. But anyway, this is the area they lived in, right above the St. John's Bridge, and he would come into St. John's every so often to cash a disability check, or I'm not sure if it was a gov some kind of uh, veteran's benefit check, and then go up back up into the forest, and he raised his daughter up there and taught her out of encyclopedias. And Anyway, it's historic. This is uh, the home site of the, um, the Irvings, for whom Irvington is named. This is uh, next to the Memorial Coliseum, which is now on the National Register. It was in danger of you know, becoming something else, getting destroyed a few years ago. It was it a baseball stadium or something like that? I can't remember what it was, the, the idea. Merritt Paulson wanted to do something with it. Okay, anyway, it's preserved. It's a great example of the international style of architecture. So I wrote a book about stairs, and one of the uh, things that fascinated me was, you know, as you're driving along, you, you'll see the occasional staircase, and so I thought, well, I'll go investigate them all, and I'll, I'll take, take me an hour or so. There's going to be one on each end of each bridge, but there weren't. There were this many, like the Hawthorne Bridge had, has nine stairs coming off it, and, uh, you know, it just, if you're quirky and you like to have an excuse just to get out, that's a good thing to do on a Sunday morning is go find them all and climb them. I like this one, especially just for the different textures and colors of the metal. It's kind of very sculptural, urban sculpture. This is a Broadway bridge. Another Broadway bridge stairs right by Union Station. I think it's, it's very complimentary with Union Station. So you can't do this one anymore. This is the, the Selwood Bridge that nobody loved. <laughs> it wasn't very lovable. And so this staircase, uh, but the story I love about this is this particular warehouse got built, who knows when, around some of these bridge supports. And so the bridge supports were inside the interior walls of that building. And so they were like, oh, well, I guess we can't inspect those. And so, they, <laughs> so, they, so they, yeah, so that building, of course, is gone. That got torn down several years ago in preparation for the new construction. This is one of those... Um, places that exist in the city because of, of <coughs> activists. The Mount Hood Freeway was planned to run uh, from Gresham to Portland through southeast Portland. And it was one of the freeways that Moses had, um, Robert Moses had proposed. And so it was, you know, just how things are in, when government gets a hold of them. The money was, had gotten, been gotten from the federal government and this project looked like it was a go. And the, neighbors, the neighborhoods were all deemed poverty pockets, which is a, a good way to make people, kind of influence people's mind that they're not really that worth saving. But the people who live there didn't think they were living in poverty pockets. They liked where they lived. I mean, this does not look like a poverty pocket to me, that house. So um, Neil Goldschmidt was running for mayor of Portland at the time. And he got on board with the anti-freeway group, and he argued very, you know, he was successful, very successful at um, persuasive. And his argument was, you know, well, why are we putting these freeways through Portland? They're not benefiting Portlanders, they're benefiting everybody but Portlanders. And so that argument kind of brought everybody, coalesced uh, enough support against the freeway, and it didn't get built. Um, but what they did do with the money was um, the light rail, the blue line. Um, and also some, some um, Cornell Road work. Old South Portland, a neighborhood um, also known as Lair Hill, was what I've seen called uh, Portland's first suburb. It, was, it had its first streetcar line, a horse-drawn streetcar in the 1870s. So by the 1890s, um, it had been superseded by newer, nicer neighborhoods, some of them further uphill as the city was growing. The riverfront was getting industrialized. So people of means were moving away. And so this neighborhood was um, becoming, you know, um, what they call, Carl Abbott calls an immigrant stopover neighborhood. And it was the perfect neighborhood for um, Eastern uh, or Jews from Eastern Europe and Southern Italy, um, 
Catholics from southern Italy. Anyway, it became a hugely ethnic neighborhood, uh, and there were many synagogues. Uh, the history is rich. I write about it in one of my books, Portland City Walks. About half the neighborhood disappeared in the city's first urban renewal project, the um, South Auditorium District, where the auditorium is today, and um, uh, the Keller Fountain, things like that. That was all full of synagogues, homes, businesses. But this is the last existing one there. And when I took the picture in 2006, it was just in its last days as Kesser Israel, you can see. Um, and Kesser Israel moved further out in southwest Portland because it's, um, what, what do you call it, not conservative, but um, Thank you. It's Orthodox. And so you walk to, to services on the Sabbath. You don't drive. And so no, not too many of the congregants live near this anymore. So they moved to uh, further out in Southwest. And this got sold to a Christian church, and, um, which is what it started out life as before the neighborhood became um, an, an immigrant neighborhood. Really great place to walk. Where is this building? This is at 2nd and Mead in Southwest Portland. It's one of those neighborhoods you don't want to drive in because you'll keep running into dead ends with freeways and things like that, but it's just full of you know, 1870s homes, and um, Lair Hill Park is there, uh, so a Carnegie Library, it's really, and some good places to eat, too. So another interesting uh, element of old urban scenes are the fire stations, and this is one of the many fire stations around here that were built in the horse-drawn era. So the horses lived on this floor, they lived on that floor, and all their harnessing would hang from uh, the ceiling, this high ceiling, and then could drop right on the horse when the fire alarm rang, and they could bolt out. The men would sleep upstairs. This functioned both as a, a lookout tower. This is at uh, like a 34th and Belmont in southeast Portland. It was uh, the firefighter who runs the museum that now occupies this told me that this was much taller at the time. And then also it's hollow, and so you hang your um, cotton hoses in there to dry. You can go tour this museum now. Um, here's another uh, horse drawn from the horse drawn era. This is up in Kenton. Another just fascinating neighborhood. You can take the Max Yellow Line to the Paul Bunyan stop, otherwise known as Interstate Avenue. I, I actually I can't remember what it's called. But anyway, um, really interesting town or uh, neighborhood. It was a company district that uh, Swift, the meat packing company, bought thousands of acres in the slough and then. Um, started selling lots to um, workers. And these are good examples of some of the little 600 square foot um, homes that um, guys who worked in the slaughterhouses and the stockyards would live here. And they could take the, um, the trolley over to the slough, which is just about a mile north of there. And then on the other side of the main drag, which is North Denver Avenue here, are, were you know, large grand homes that the executives lived in. So there's this real clear delineation um, and then the Paul Bunyan statue dates from 1959. It was built for Oregon Centennial. And it was another story of, um, you know, people took it for granted. It was just some quirky little bit of roadside architecture. And then some guy from the Midwest decided he wanted to buy it and take it to um, grace his commercial venue. I don't know if he had a restaurant or something. And so people in Kenton got upset about that, and they um, had Paul listed on the National Register, and he's been given a new coat of paint and it looks very good. <laughs> it's very photogenic. Here's another firehouse. This is in Mount Tabor and it doesn't look like a firehouse but you can see the forensic pedestrian knows that that means that kind of grid-like um, pavement was put in, the old, in front of the old firehouses so that when the horses burst out this, which used to be the big door, um, they would get, have traction on wet pavement. And you still see that in front of a lot of old firehouses in Portland. And this, that one that I just showed is a coffee house, and you can still see the floor. So after we got mechanized fire trucks, um, fire stations didn't have to be tall like that anymore. And in Irvington, Irvington was one of those neighborhoods that had um, covenants, no commercial structures. Um, houses had to be a certain, uh, like $4,500, things like that. Uh, and no commercial structures meant no churches even, and of course not a fire station. But as, this, as Irvington um, became more and more populated and built up, the fire marshal said, well, you need to have a fire station nearby, you know. And uh, people argued against it, so he said, okay, I'll, I'll make something that doesn't look like a fire station. So he designed this little bungalow, and these doors here opened up, and the truck could just slip away in there, and no one would ever know. 
there was a firehouse. There was a firehouse. And so today, this is on Northeast 24th Avenue. It, they, t they bricked in the doorway. It's not nearly as attractive, but it's um, Project Linkage, which provides, um, it takes uh, elders, you know, shopping and, and to doctor appointments so they can remain in their homes. Mount Tabor and the reservoirs. Uh, this is reservoir number one. It's the first one that got built, and there weren't any landsliding issues on Mount Tabor. Whoops, let me back up. Tell me when I need to stop, too, okay? Go till 8 o'clock? Keep going and stop at 8. Okay. Uh, so what's charming about this is uh, there's a little um, spring on Mount Tabor, and right here at the north end of it, the spring is still there, and this was a water fountain. The water would bubble up, and you can still see it's dripping and, and um, flowing. And then there was a little cup hanging from up here. You can see the ring. And you could dip your, the tin cup into, the, um, into this basin of water and have a drink and then put the cup back for the next person passing by. And you could stand on this little iron uh, step. So um, when somebody explained what this was to me, I was really delighted. I, I'd seen it and had no idea what it was. It does say 1894 on it, but I had no idea it was a, a fountain at one point. So East Burnside, uh, this is a very hip area these days. And in the 1920s, they had to widen Burnside. And so uh, as what happened often when roads were widened is buildings had to be torn down. But somebody was pretty inventive at the, um, when, in this case. And they said, well, why not, you know, when we're going to widen it, we're going to take away the sidewalk that used to run here about where these cars are. Let's just c carve out the f main floor of the building and run the sidewalk down it. And then this, um, we won't have to tear the building down. And so here's what it looks like. And there's a, a couple blocks of this on East Burnside and on Gleason in Portland. Another thing, you know, I, I looked at that for years and thought, well, why is this building like on stilts? It didn't make sense to me. And then once I found out, I don't know how I found out, it was, you know, like somebody had given me a gift, a little mystery un unraveled. So you all should know what this is. <laughs> what is it? No. No. It's not. That is a good guess, though. No one's ever guessed that before. Um, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's Oswego Lake. And Oswego Lake, I've heard people say it's man-made, and it's, it's, um, it's not man-made. It's an old river channel of the Tualatin River, and when the Missoula floods came down, they scoured out that channel. And so it has this, this orientation, just as you'd imagine it would from the floods of kind of northeast to southwest. It's quite deep, um, even though, you know, the muck starts at about 55 feet. There's these basalt caverns under that that go down hundreds and hundreds of feet. And it was dammed with the very first settler, Durham, for a, a mill, and then it was subsequently dammed um, for power generation and things like that. Uh, but was basically seen as a worthless bit of real estate until um, all the trees had been logged off by Oregon Iron and Steel, and they burned up the trees to make charcoal for their um, furnace. And then uh, when a streetcar came out, I don't know if it was a streetcar or, or um, inner urban line, but anyway, somebody thought, you know what, this would make some nice lakefront property. And so they started developing it in the, I think in the late teens at that point. And so now it looks like that. Uh, quite a difference. Isn't that, I mean, it's just so, so different. Uh, and then this is what it looked like a few years ago when they put the new sewer pipe in the bottom of the lake. It went down and uh, it was just fascinating. So this muck here is deadly stuff that um, one, one of the workers did fall in and he got sucked in up to his um, armpits within minutes. It's just um, like quicksand and so, and it does go down to untold depths. Here, and so uh, they were very successful real estate developers in selling these lakefront lots. And people, they called, um, like, they, it was Oswego then. It didn't become Lake Oswego until 1959 when it merged with Lake Grove. So Oswego um, in the 20s was a place where you could, quote, live where you play. And there were bridal paths through there. And there was the hunt club and the country club. You could swim in the lake. I've read stories of, of girls that used to swim the length of the lake before it filled up with algae. And there were races there. Races? What kind of swimming races? Three and a half mile race from one end to the other. Yeah. And I've seen pictures of um, women doing um, synchronized swimming in it, water ballet. Just so beautiful. It was just a real paradise. 
Uh, and so anyway, it's, the lake, lakefront lots were very popular, and so they decided, the developers said, well, there's a swamp on, one, on the east end of the lake. Um, they called it the duck pond at the time. That's right adjacent to Highway 43. Let's, let's connect it to the main lake with the channel, and then we'll have a whole bunch more lakefront property. And so they did, and that's the part of the lake you can see readily from Highway 43. And here's what it looked like during the drawdown. Um, one of my favorite places is Forest Grove because it's so historic. Uh, there's an old neighborhood there that was given to this um, university back in the 1850s as an endowment. And so some of the homes date from the 1850s, and this is 1878. It has five giant sequoias um, all around it. But these two have been cut down to about this level just recently. Um, and so it's, and they were really encroaching on the house, but it is, it, I'm glad I got the photo when I did. Great place to visit. Uh, House of Providence up in Vancouver, designed by the first architect in the Pacific Northwest, a woman, a nun, who uh, would uh, go around and strong arm people into donating money to support her causes, uh, literally. And she, um, uh, one person she strong armed was this man named Lowell Hidden. And she said, I need bricks. I've got a lot of projects I want to build, and I need bricks. So Lowell Hidden started the Hidden Brickyard in Vancouver for her. And, um, and this still exists, the House of Providence. It's very old. And then I found a hidden brick a couple years ago in, <laughs> in Hollywood at somebody's parking strip. The brickyard doesn't exist anymore. Should we stop? This might be... Okay, uh, so I'm fascinated by uh, citizen activists because I myself don't have the fortitude to fight those battles that can go on for years. And what, so Irvington in Portland is, the whole neighborhood is now on the National Register of Historic Places as of just a few years ago. Uh, but it was in danger of being um, decimated. Everything west of 15th was going to become a light industrial park. Uh, everything east of 15th was seen as, a, you know, poverty pocket, even though there's mansions there. And so developers could um, freely, whoops, just tear down old homes and build these, um, you know, mid-century, not as good a quality construction. Uh, and then the citizens of Irvington, these, you know, people who are like the first baby boomers, people who are now in their 60s or so, uh, fought back and formed the Irvington Community Association and started, you know, preserving their neighborhood. And these are some of the homes in Irvington that are just, it's an incredible range of architectural styles from mansions to craftsmen to kind of this um, Jacobean style. Um, just, it's a delight. I, I never, I didn't even bother planning a route because every street you're on has got something interesting. This is across Broadway. This is the Sullivan's Gulch neighborhood that was also slated to be turned into high rises like this because um, I-84 is on one side. Uh, neighbors fought back and got some zoning step downs so that you, you know, these, this kind of high density it was allowed up to a certain point, and then these single family homes were retained. And it's it's a wonderful neighborhood to explore on foot. Really old homes. More WPA work. In, our, in the public schools, and I imagine Milwaukee's got similar things like this in the, in the public schools. Uh, but some of the Portland Public School murals have been painted over as many as seven times. So this one never d did get painted, and it, you can go visit it in the Irvington School just by letting them know you want to see it. More WPA work. This is in Gresham. The same guy that did the iron work at, at um, Timberline did this, O.B. Dawson. Just masterpieces. He, he, he makes iron just look so graceful. Uh, this is Lewis and Clark College, and, and actually, I've been told that they would rather I not promote this as a walking destination, but it's so pretty, mm -hmm. and uh, so I did go there one day, and there's the reflecting pool behind the mansion, and here's a, another old brick from <laughs> 1870, and those bricks now are worth like $100 on eBay. I didn't take that one, but I do have one that my mother-in-law gave me. Uh, E.J. Jeffrey, he, he, um, his um, brickyard was where the stadium Fred Meyer is in northwest Portland. If you know Temple Beth Israel in um, northwest Portland, the architect, this is the same architect, Harry, um, who's it? Oh, it's, oh, Herman Brookman. You can kind of see some similar. And this, what, the, one of the stories about this particular home, which is on southeast Ankeny, is that um, 
well, the Bitars owned it for years. He was the Lebanese consul. And when they sold it, it, there was a newspaper story, and it said that uh, Mr. Bitar, when he was a young man, delivered groceries in the neighborhoods, and he would pedal by this house and say, and he said, one day I'm going to own that house. And he did buy it and lived there for 50 years. Um, and then it sold uh, in 2006, yeah, after they had died. Quonset huts, another thing to build a walk around. You might not have a lot of takers if you invite people on a Quonset hut walk, but I think they're fascinating. 170,000 of these were built during the war, and, um, and then afterwards you could get them for $1,000. Um, and I love this one because of the juxtaposition of this beautiful creek tumbling out of Forest Park, and then um, this pretty historic structure, still in use. Southeast Portland, there's lots of really intriguing houses of worship, everything from Buddhist to Mormon to this Catholic um, uh, convent, uh, a Maronite church, a very unusual branch of Catholicism in Laurelhurst, or not Laurelhurst, but um, Lad's Edition. Yeah, yeah, gorgeous building. So uh, I love the way things like this are just tucked away on streets on it. Yeah, I forget the numbered street, but uh, the Jansen building in um, the current neighborhood, also a really unknown neighborhood in Portland filled with light industrial buildings like this and 1920s apartment buildings that will just knock your socks off how gorgeous they are. Um, this is the Swan Island Lagoon. So if, if you take that Wad Bluff Trail, you'll be walking right by here. And this is a big um, wind tunnel to test the aerodynamics of truck bodies that Freightliner owns. This used to be the main channel of the uh, Willamette River. And then on the other side here is the current channel on the other side of the um, land there. And there's lots of shipbuilding and dry docks in there. It's a good place to explore. Washington Park. This is above Northwest 20, uh, or 24th and Burnside. Um, the zoo's penguins or seals used to be uh, here, seals. Oh, and that is the last slide. Mm -hmm. Yay, we made it. <laughs> so um, those are my books, and I don't have any of this one, but you can get them all at stores or libraries. <laughs> have them. <laughs> and uh, so if you have any questions, thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. And thank you. Thank you.